um, <laughs> certification in functional diagnostic nutrition, which is a mouthful. But functional, meaning we're always looking at how the systems are operating in the body. These are the particular systems that we're looking at. We're looking at hormones, immune, digestive, detoxification, environment, and neurotransmitters. Diagnostic meaning I use labs. So I use particular labs to help assess how the body is doing. Lisa, come on in. In there. Great. I'm just sharing sharing with a group. My certification basically is the functional diagnostic using labs and then nutrition is basically what can we put in the body on a daily basis to help support it and help it feel good. Um, so I want to refer a little bit to a, we've done this a few times, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again, especially for those members that haven't been here. And we're going to start out, I'm going to have Maureen and Matthew help me on this one. We're going to start out with Okay, so what is that thing that holds our brain? What is that thing called? A head, you got it. So here we have our head or brain in here. And what's connected to the head? The neck. The neck, as well as what's the whole rest of it called? The body. The body, you got it. So here is body. And these two are always communicating with each other. And how do they communicate? Through nerves. We have nerves. Cells and blood. Blood flows all the way through our body. And when everything's communicating optimally and everything's running uh, perfectly well, we can say that we have 100% function. Another way of also saying it, that is that our body's at a state of ease. It feels really relaxed because it can do everything that it wants to do and that it needs to do. When it's not feeling relaxed and feeling like it's doing everything that it needs to do, we develop symptoms. Symptoms are feeling sick. What could be another symptom? Okay. Headaches is a great one. An achy arm, stomach ache, any of those things could be classified as a symptom. This is usually when we go see our doctor. And we need that relief care. But when we develop symptoms, we can say that our body is at a state of dis-ease. Dis-ease, and I'm sure we recognize that word as disease. We can also say that we have malfunction in our systems. This is what I'm always looking at. Why? What are the root causes for this malfunction or disease? So, um, and as I shared with you, as a functional diagnostic nutrition, I'm always looking at functions and systems. This is our third session of a four-part series. In session one, we talked about getting to the root cause, understanding why people become sick. And I just heard a statistic recently that said that 95% of all sickness can be related to at least a year prior to a very stressful event, whether it was a physical stress or an emotional stress. So we need to understand why is the body malfunctioning? I also shared with you in session one about the adrenals, those two little glands that sit on top of our kidneys, and what they do in response to stress. And we talked about two types of stress, external stress and internal stress. And external stress might be schoolwork, we might find that stressful. Um, socializing with our friends, we might find that stressful. Um, Work-related issues might be stressful, having to travel so far to work and, and from. Fortunately, most of us don't have to deal with that, but some of us do. Um, and we talked about how to reduce that stress. But most importantly, understanding that when we have that type of stress that is repeatedly happening, it affects our adrenals. Now, our adrenals release this, um, this steroid called cortisol. And it does that, and I always share the bear story. If we're sitting in our front yard, we're raking the leaves, um, and we see a bear coming into the front yard, what happens? Our heart starts to race, we get sweaty, our, uh, our pupils dilate, and that creates a stress response. And our bodies are allowed and ready for something like that that happens maybe one time a day. But if we have stress that's occurring all day long, whether it's a combination of that external stress or multiple internal stresses, then those adrenals are releasing cortisol all day long. And they get to a point where cortisol can't do it anymore there's a breakdown in that loop. So we have to support our adrenals as much as we can. And we have to identify all those areas of inflammation, which 
which are shown right here. Identify those areas are those the ones that can be affecting my systems. Like I said, I, I do that through lab tests, but there's a lot that you can do even before you come see me. Um, so reducing stress can be done by what you have control over, which is regulating your blood sugar. We talked about making sure that you manage your meals throughout the day so that you're not waiting for starving. If you're feeling you know, so hungry, you can't hold it, um, you can't wait anymore, or you have a crash. Never have a food emergency. Now, I will tell you, I have those myself, and I try not to, though. I always try to be, pre to have, be prepared. Um, and so, uh, He's not great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 13-year-old growing. Yeah, yes. they're always hungry. So regulating your blood sugar is really important, especially making sure that each one of those meals involves some protein, some carbohydrates, and some fats. And then taking real time for self. And I mentioned that um, it's 15 minutes a, a, a day is, is a good start. And I see some uh, nudging over there, so I know someone needs to be doing that. But I put real time. That doesn't mean doing the laundry or doing the dishes or paying the bills. That really means sitting down and just breathing and having silence and quiet and allowing yourself to relax. So we talked about that in session one. In session two, which was just last week, we talked about listening to your gut and the digestive system and understanding that 80% of our immune system sits right here. So we have to support that, that digestive system as much as possible, and we do that of course, by taking in the proper foods as best as we can, but also trying to identify, does our, is our digestive system absorbing and assimilating those nutrients from the foods we're taking in? So um, in discussing in length about the digestive system, I shared with you it can be major support for your health, but it could also add as a major stress. And that's number five on, our, on my list of nine inflammatory markers to look for. So session three is today, and we are going to talk about food sensitivities, and uh, I really like this one. And this is one of my favorite quotes, and I did modify it to make it more gender friendly, but the original quote is, one man's meat is another man's poison. And uh, unknown, so we're not quite sure who the author is of that, but I think that really sums us up, and what I love about it too is it reinforces that we're all individuals. To say that we should all be eating the same way, we should all be eating at the same times of the day, and we should all be eating the same foods takes away from our individuality, which I find very empowering. I love it to know that, hey, I'm Lynn, and I have different needs than Brian does. So I think that's really key, and I love that phrase. So we're going to talk about food sensitivities today. And in doing so, I just want to touch base with this digestive system and how this is related to the adrenals. Remember, once again, when your digestive system isn't working optimally, what occurs is that it stresses the adrenals out. So the adrenals are releasing cortisol all day long because the digestive system isn't happening. Food sensitivities is a huge contributing factor in that digestive system. So, and then also keep in mind that when the adrenals are stressed out, they deplete that wonderful immune boosting antibody that we have in our gut. So it's just cyclical. You end up just going all the, you know, constantly in this endless cycle that just won't end. So it's important to recognize how you can support the adrenals and how you can support the gut. Food sensitivity is a key area in doing that. Now, there's always a lot of questions and there's uh, discussions about food allergies, food sensitivities, food intolerances, which is it, what do I have? A true food allergy is actually an IgE response. Now, last week I talked about secretory IgA. And that's the antibody, the main um, immunoglobin that sits in our gut and creates 80% of our immune system. Well, there are other antibody groups as well. There's IgE, there's IgG, there's IgA, and there's IgM. And I had a great speaker talk about how we have the Marines in our body, we have the Navy, we have the Armed Forces, and we have the, um, the Energetic Navy SEALs. So, and I just love those analogies because that's basically what we have is little militaries that are sitting in our body and they're trying to fight all those invaders, anything that's coming into the body that's foreign. So um, it's necessary to understand the differences. IgE is a true allergy. IgE antibodies are present in your skin, in your lungs, and in your mucous membranes. 
they are, um, that's the immediate reactions that you usually get or people can often get as a result of either taking in a food, of an environmental toxin, whatever it may be. It's usually quite severe in reaction. Um, it can cause um, it, as severe as a reaction as anaphylaxis. So those are the IgE responses. It's not that common IgE uh, allergies aren't, but it's necessary to understand it. And some people will know, like if they pet a cat, they sneeze right away, that would be an IgE response. Now, there's also the IgG antibodies. And these are the antibodies that we're talking about when we discuss food sensitivities. These are the ones that can have a delayed onset. So you eat a food, and up to three days later, it's, it's created an effect on your body. And it's okay, maybe if you only have one of them, which you don't even know that you may have this. And so if you have multiples of those, that's a cumulative stress load on the body. And as I always emphasize, we want to reduce that total stress load as much as possible. Identify the areas that need support. And if you give the body the tools it needs, it will sort itself out. It wants to. It's constantly striving to be in that state of ease, like we discussed. So with IgG food sensitivities, it's delayed, as I mentioned. It creates a chronic, low-grade inflammation. And so, you know, and I've had people say to me, well, yeah, but how can this really affect my health? I don't understand. What does that have to do with my head? What does it have to do with my achy joints? And as I discussed with you, just to reinforce and getting back to that gut and how central that is to our immune system and making us feel good, and that adrenal digestive loop that we talked about. So, we have the IgG food sensitivities, the IgE food sensitivities. I mentioned to you that there's the IgA and IgM. Those get tested often, but those are typically a response to um, more immune system, not necessarily food sensitivity. So those are the two, the IgE and the IgG are the two different types. Now, medical doctors um, in general test for IgE. They want the emergency response. That's, that's what they're trained to do, is to offer that emergency relief. They're necessarily not there to identify if you have chronic low grade inflammation. So the, as much as they recognize it, you may hear, and I've also heard uh, quite a few of my clients say to me, well, the doctors say that this test isn't any good. Well, it's different. It's different than what the IgE tests are. So that's really an important distinction to make. Um, a couple things to tell you about, the, about any chronic low grade um, sensitivities. And how do you know if these could be occurring? Um, but before I go there, everybody with me? Any questions? I feel like I'm kind of... I do have a question. You talk about allergies and sensitivities. Mm -hmm. What about intolerances? Are those the IgA, the IgMs? No, no. no. Intolerances are a chemical that. reactivity, oh. reaction. So they're a chemical reaction. So um, tyramine is a great example of that. So if you have, you, drink, you eat cheese, you drink wine, and you have a headache, that is a chemical reaction. So it, it depends on the individual. Like I'll have an individual say to me, wow, my sensitivity didn't show anything about dairy, but every time I eat dairy, I feel crampy or I feel sick. Oh, it's a chemical so it would be more of a chemical reaction. Oh, exactly. So those are the intolerances as well. Uh -huh. So um, any other questions? I feel like I'm preaching. No, you're so, doing great. Oh, okay, everybody understand. No, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure of that. Okay, so we have... Um, things to look for. These are some maybe obvious but not so obvious signs that you may see in individuals that can suggest there might be a chronic low grade sensitivity. Dark circles under the eyes. So if you ever know anyone that ever has dark circles under the eyes and you know them well enough, you could suggest, you know what, you may not get your food sensitivities. <laughs> So I was just talking about some um, some more um, general signs that you may pick up in individuals if you suspect that they may have food sensitivities or even with yourself. So dark circles under the eyes I had started with. Um, another one is chronic uh, congestion. Because as I shared with you last week with the mucous membrane, remember it starts here and it goes continuously all through, down through into through the GI tract and then out through the rectum. So it's one long fluid component. You have disruption here, it can affect here. So 
it's really important to understand that. And uh, food sensitivities, of course, can cause inflammation. We talked about what inflammation is. Do you remember, Maury? What's it called? Uh, 